Obsessive compulsive disorder is a really interesting condition. It certainly appears separate from Tourette syndrome. There is just obsessive compulsive disorder. We're talking about obsessive compulsive disorder in conjunction, conjunction with tics as part of Tourette syndrome. So obsessions are intrusive thoughts. Um, interestingly, I had mentioned to you that I had hoped that Eric would not have obsessive compulsive disorder. And as far as I knew, when after his diagnosis at 13, he didn't have obsessive compulsive disorder. We live near um, McLean's Hospital, is outside of Boston. It was a well-known psychiatric hospital. It's also the it also was the um, main Tourette clinic for all of the Boston, Massachusetts area. And Eric was invited, we were invited to have Eric be part of a study that was being done at McLean's Hospital. So I took him to McLean's and he met with an examiner all day. And at one point she came out and she said to me, when was he diagnosed with OCD? And I said, he doesn't have OCD. And she said, oh, yes he does. <laughs> I said, he does? What does he do? He was a counter. So his obsession was to know how many things there were in a room. His compulsion was to count. I had no idea. So imagine here he is working in school and he's thinking about this obsession. He's thinking about what if there's a fire, what if mom goes into the house, how much work is he getting? This is, this is an ongoing obsession. How many of you have ever got a song stuck in your head? Okay, you get a song stuck in your head. I keep getting Faith Hill songs stuck in my head. Um, I love Faith Hill. But imagine that this is going on in your head and you're trying to focus on your work. It's very, very difficult to do. So an obsession is, is something that gets stuck and a compulsion is very often something that you do to take care of that. So Eric's compulsion was counting. So he would count floor tiles. He would count ceiling tiles. Um, he would count how many times he chewed on his right side. He would count how many times he chewed on the left side. All of this counting makes it very, very difficult to focus on the things that you're doing. One of the difficult aspects about OCD as opposed to the tics is that they're often not apparent to people around you. So as, you, as I've just explained, I never knew that Eric had OCD. Later on, when he did things that were much more apparent, it became clear to me. But at the beginning, I had no idea he was doing this. And this makes a child feel very isolated um, because no one knows that this is happening. So here are some more examples of OCD. These are some very common obsessions, germ obsessions, neatness. Eric did not have a problem with neatness. Absolutely not. His room was an utter disaster. I have not been to his latest apartment, I'm afraid. Um, symmetry, um, that's the, the balancing of counting and those kinds of things. And then the compulsions. Eric did have a germ compulsion for about a week, literally for a week. And I walked by the bathroom door one day and he was washing his hands and the bubbles were just coming everywhere. That one lasted about a week. Um, but there are kids who have significant germ, germ obsessions and they will hold their breath going past other people. They're afraid of catching germs. Eric had a very interesting obsession one time. He walked into his bedroom and he flipped on his light switch, as we all do when we walk into a room. And then he turned his light switch off. And he turned it back on again and off again for one hour. So here's my very bright, he happens to be a very bright kid. Here's my very bright 15-year-old standing at the doorway to his room, turning his light switch on and off. I tried to redirect him. He started to cry. I called his behavioral therapist, who was a good friend and on speed dial, and I said, what do I do? And he said, is he hurting himself? I said, no. He said, leave him alone. It will, he'll stop when he gets tired. The light switch blew, the, la the lamp blew, and when he was tired, he stopped. But it was very, very bizarre to watch. And it was, very, it was very scary to watch. It was scary for him, it was scary to me because I couldn't redirect him and he couldn't redirect himself. Um, so that was his obsession and his compulsion and it was difficult to interfere with it. 
A number of years ago, there was a basketball player for the Denver Nuggets who had Tourette syndrome. His, his name was Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. And um, he would practice with his, with his teammates. And at the end of the day, he would throw the, ba the ball into the basket one more time. And then he would do it one more time after that. And his teammates would all leave. And he would continue to practice for three or four hours. And why was he practicing? Because he didn't like the, way, the sound of the ball going through the hoop. So his obsession was it didn't sound right. His compulsion was to keep throwing the ball until it sounded right to him. The good news was that he became the free throw champion of the <laughs> NBA that year. So there was a good news to that story. Um, but it can be, people can perform these over and over again, even though it's distressing to them. Eric's light switch didn't sound right to him. It was very distressing for him to continually flip that light switch on and off. But he needed to do it. And in some cases, people don't see some of their things as unusual. All of his counting didn't seem unusual. Now, some of you may be sitting here and saying, you know, I do some weird things. I always go back and check, did I lock? How many of you go back and check and see, make sure you lock the door? Yeah, you check and make sure you turned off your iron. I don't even turn off my iron. I pull the plug on my iron. That's how I know. Um, for years, I would open up my, I would, I would turn off my car, put the keys in my bag, go to get out of my car, unzip the bag, check to make sure the keys are in the bag. I do that two or three times. Now I have a car that has a key fob that I just keep in my bag. I don't have to actually put it in the lock. I still check. <laughs> which is so silly because I can't turn the car on without it. So those are some pieces of obsessive compulsive disorder. It appears to be related to possibly to serotonin. There is no specific gene at this time for OCD as there is no specific gene at this time for Tourette's syndrome. Tourette's is thought to be a spectrum disorder because it includes not just the, the tics but these other comorbid conditions. The scientists are working hard to isolate a gene um, hoping that that would help, that they would be able to then figure out what causes Tourette and also the associated disorders. Um, perfectionism. Um, I worked with a student one day, and um, he used to erase things and uh, rewrite. And I said to his, I had an IEP meeting with his mother one day, and I said, what does his room look like? And she said, his room is perfection. Everything is neat and orderly, and his desk is always orderly, and his shirts are all lined up, and his shoes are all lined up. And I'm thinking, yes, because he has OCD, and you don't recognize that. Um, it's like your mental brakes get stuck. That's why I have the big word stuck there. This is really important. Sometimes the kids worry that they're crazy, because this feels very crazy. As I'm sure when you're going back to check that lock for the third time, it feels a little weird. You know that you've, you've locked that lock, but you go back and you check one more time. That's why kids feel isolated and they, they're aware that they're different from their family and from their friends. So transitioning is very, very difficult um, for kids with OCD because they are stuck. Remember the word, when you think about OCD, think about the word stuck. So transitioning from one activity to the other is difficult for them because they want to stay where they are. I know that my son, when my son was in, in school, if he was passing a fire alarm, he put his hands in his pocket. There was an itchy thing about just wanting to go near that fire alarm, so his solution was to put his hands in his pocket. Um, in the inability to tolerate mistakes. So how do you prevent making mistakes? Don't get started. The best way not to make a mistake, mistake is not to get started. So some kids who have OCD, their solution to being perfectionist, to be perfectionist is never to get started. So here are these bright kids who look, who look like they're just being a, a, um, obstructive or difficult when in reality it's their OCD they don't want to start. Refusal to eat because their germ sessions not completing their work. Um, going back to the counting for a moment, I knew of a young woman, a young, a young girl when she was in high school, who was also a counter. So she counted when she would go to do a reading assignment, she would count every word on the line. 
and every line in the paragraph. How much reading did she get done? None. We'll talk in a moment what the solution was for that. So the greatest gift for kids with Tourette, uh, with um, obsessive compulsive disorder and Tourette's, is computers, assistive technology, um, because it makes their writing it makes their writing easier. They don't get stuck on crossing things out, erasing things. It's much easier to use a com to use a computer. They sometimes do get stuck on the delete button. I do warn you about that. Um, so what did we do for the student who was counting everything? We gave her an audio book. Usually when we give kids audio books, audio books, we also give them a book to read with it. Not the kid who was counting because we didn't want her to see the book. So we just gave her the audio book and not a book in front of her because she would have continued to count. So an audio book. Again, through every one of the, the associated disorders that we'll talk about this morning, extended time on tests is really important. Staying in touch with, par with parents. Um, kids with OCD very often work with uh, behavioral therapists. They may also be working with a cognitive therapist. Staying in touch with that team if they have both is important. Again, educating the, the, the school about this. And a really, really important part that we sometimes forget to do is <coughs> ask the student, what can I do to help you? What would really work for you? So a student had a compulsion for a very, very sharp pencil, driving the teacher crazy, getting up and sharpening his pencil all the time. What could we do to help you? Can I have, can I have a lot of sharpened pencils, or can I have a mechanical pencil? That was the end of the problem. Teacher was no longer crazy. The kid had a sharp point. Everybody was happy. Sometimes the simplest solutions are the ones that we tend to overlook. Um, we need to educate teachers that it's OK to give kids supplies. It's really OK to give them what they need. 